Hey guys, brand new podcast, shirtless from the man cave, brand new hat. Thank out S. Thank you, SF Grippy. I love these hats. He sends me out. These are this is his logo on the back right there. You can find them on Instagram. I love these hats. Um, shout out also, by the way, not really sponsors, just friends who are sending me cool shit. Shout out to Dixon. I wore this shirt on my live stream on Zoom last Friday. Thank you to everyone who came to the Zoom happy hour. Secret time. I'm doing another one in not this Friday, but next Friday. Secret time. Um, but yeah, it was awesome. Thank you, everyone who came. That was a lot of fun. It was really cool. And you know, it's so funny. You do stuff and then you, you kind of feel like, what am I trying to be a celebrity or something? And then you talk to people who are, and you don't realize everyone's just been home for fucking 45 days. A lot of people have been by themselves in their apartment for 45 days, not even getting to interact with people. And they go outside and stuff, but they don't get to interact. So that Zoom was a lot of fun. And it was really cool to kind of talk. We talked to one guy who was like, yeah, I've been in my apartment for 45 days. I'm losing my fucking mind. Thank you. I'm getting to have a cocktail. And you're like, that's awesome. So for those of you that don't know, Zoom happy hour, 500 people. Um, it fills up fast. So I'll release the info and the password next week. Or yeah, next week. Not doing one this week. Uh, haven't been boozing really totally, although everyone seems to have opinions about that. I don't know. It's crazy. I think sometimes people have opinions. They get upset if I'm not drinking. And then some, every, and then so many people are just like, apparently health nuts and then think that drinking i guess maybe a lot of people grow up with alcoholic dads that's what it seems like to me anyway new two bears one cave is out right now new bill bird is out one right now um and we've got some podcasts for you this week this one's a fucking great one i've been wanting to do this podcast for a long time thank god for zoom because i had the opportunity to sit down with a guy who i am literally obsessed with I watch more of diners, drive-ins and dives and guys grocery games than I watch of anything in the world. I love diners, drive-ins and dives. I love what it does for small businesses. If you don't know, it is one of the greatest. It's, it's just a great show highlighting cool, uh, cool places that have great recipes, great, authentic, just like off like usually little, little different recipes like it's it's out of this world i don't need to sell you on diners drive-ins and dives and i don't need you to sell you on dr- guys grocery games because i was on that show it's a fucking great show it is a great show this dude's a guy i've known of longer than i've known i just really i've met him a few times when we worked on uh try when i worked on travel channel and he was always the nicest kindest guy and and just really genuine kind of guy that when he talks to you, he's talking to you as opposed to a lot of times in this business, you'll talk to people that talk over your shoulder and you're like, are you looking for someone? There's a lot of people like that in this business. That is not Guy Fieri. Guy Fieri is a guy that when he talks to you, he talks to you. I remember the first time I shook his hand, he shook my hand. He looked at my watch. The only other person that ever did this other than him is my good friend, Russell Peters. He shook my hand, looked at my watch and he goes, nice. (laughs) I'll never forget that. Um, uh, but yeah, he's an awesome guy. He's been he's been a Food Network staple for I think the better part of the two thousands. Um, he's an awesome dude, an amazing chef. And and if you look right now in the news, he is everywhere in the news. He has really taken upon himself to help restaurants, restaurant employees in this moment of of shitholeness that's going on in this country. This fucking bullshit Corona fucking virus. I'm was gonna say a moment of. Uh, troubledness or whatever the fuck the Allstate commercial says. It's not that. I'm just making me angry. And you know what all the good thing Guy has done for um, for restaurants in the past, he hasn't stopped. He did, we talk about this now, he's airing right now on Food Network a takeout edition of Diners, Drive-Ins and Dives that he's producing with his son. Uh, shout out to both his sons, Hunter and Ryder. Uh, Hunter's on this podcast. We talked to him a little bit. Uh, he's got a great vineyard called hunt and ride that I want to get, I want to get wine from shout out to the guy. If you're listening to this, you have send some bottles to your boy. Um, but he literally, ever since I've talked to him, I, I, all I do is I see his name in the news right now, him, Martha Stewart and John Krasinski are doing a $3 million potluck dinner. He's got the R E R F dot U S that is the restaurant employee relief fund you can apply for a $500 grant. And you can also donate to the R-E-R-F dot U-S. That's the Restaurant Employee Relief Fund. Um, he's an awesome dude. I'm, I'm, 
I had a great time talking to him. And so why would I bore you more with my bullshit when you can hear us talk? It's me, his son, Hunter, and ladies and gentlemen, my guest this week, Guy Fieri. Guy, I want to thank you for doing this, man. I can't tell you how <laughs> fucking obsessed I am right now with not only di- Diners, Drivers, and Dives, but Guy's Grocery Games. I regret going on Guy's Grocery Games when I did because I was unaware of how much, f- like, I was, I did not, I was not watching the show the way I am now. I am fucking obsessed. Well, let me tell you, dude, the same goes because. It's so funny that once we do something, that's my son Hunter that just walked by. He's a big fan. Uh, I, 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 I've, I've seen Hunter. I just, I think me and the girls just watched you guys uh, swim with sharks. Oh yeah, that was that was uh, stepping right off into the genius, the genius world. We didn't even know how to dive, and we learned how to dive in our pool. And then uh, we flew right from our house. We took our dive certification or did our training, got our basic paperwork. Flew to the Bahamas, got off the plane in the Bahamas at like five at night, did two more dive, uh, two more dives that we had to do, went to bed, got up at six in the morning, went back to the ocean, did our final dive, which none of what we were described to was going to be our responsibility for the dive certification, doing safety, rescue diving, and all this kind of stuff. Get done, come out of the boat, they sign the paperwork. Boom. Now we're out in the middle of the ocean diving at 6,000 feet. We weren't diving that deep, but anyhow, all happened within the course of two days. And here we are diving with sharks. It was genius. Oh, it's, it's, Hunter, it's, uh, it's, it's television production. They have no care about your safety. They just want to get the shot in. It's like, come on, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. It wasn't them. They weren't the ones being the... Uh, being reckless about it. they were actually being awesome. I mean, they don't. Uh, Food Network doesn't want to damage the, you know, the train. But um, uh, we were the ones being a little reckless. Oh yeah. yeah, we could dive. We do everything. Yeah. Fuck. So, Hunter, yeah, do you think let me, let me just say, would, would you think we you'd enjoy watched, it? We watched last night the machine. <laughs> Okay. And bro, I have to tell you, and this is what I was getting to. I'm sorry. I, I was I'm babbling and running all over the place. We do this. I do this. You do this. You know that we don't do enough research. We don't look at things enough. We don't go through enough tape. We don't do, you know, cause we're always so busy. And Hunter says, Hey, can I just show you one of his bits that I think that you're really going to like? So my wife's there, my wife, Lori, our youngest son, Ryder, who's 14. So he's, he read this is right up Ryder's alley. And on you come with no shirt and the Russian mafia. <laughs> Bro, I'm dying. I, I, I'm dying. I'm like, this is, this is the same guy that came and cooked. This is, this, this dude is that dude. There's no way. It was awesome. It was awesome. Oh, thank you. You know, I, I feel like I, I only have a career because of guys like Hunter. I have a, I have a movie deal over at Legendary, and it's just because the owner of Legendary's son saw the machine, showed it to his dad. <laughs> so, Hunter, thank you on behalf of all everyone your age that found my stuff and showed it to your parents. Thank you. Absolutely. So, I got a funny story for you. Uh, tell me, I don't know whenever we're going to start taping. God, you're a mess. We're up in our recording. Hunter's, Hunter's, Hunter's cleaning beehives right now, so he's. Uh, we have to get the beehives ready, and uh, we. It's the world of ranching is far more diverse than people think it is. They think it's all Yellowstone, which we love Yellowstone. But anyhow, so when I was a kid, so that's why I think one of the reasons it resonated with me is because I had a very similar experience, not quite Russian mafia and ripping off everybody on the train, but it wasn't bad. I lived in <laughs> France as when I was 16, I was an exchange student, yeah. and, but not a real exchange student because the exchange student has to go through a program and has to be able to speak the language. I didn't speak the language. But I conned my parents into let me when I was 16 years old to go live in a boarding house in France outside of Paris because a cousin of a friend of a somebody knew somebody that had a house that I could live in and go to a high school. So I'm like, just like diving with the sharks. I can do this, <laughs> you know. So I go there and I don't speak a lick of French. I have a translation book and I'm just faking it until I make it. And uh, thank you for the lies. But anyhow, I uh, <laughs> go there. 
And I, and I go to uh, England to visit a friend of mine from school. She happened to be doing the same thing, but she went to England where they speak, uh, where they speak English. So I take, the tra- I take the train from France to Belgium, Belgium. I take the ferry across and I get to London, go to London, go up to Yorkshire, visit her, blah, blah, blah. Okay, short, long story short, I go to leave London. I get to the train station with my ticket. It's my ticket, my ferry ticket, my ticket home. And the guy says to me, you're a day late. I said, how am I a day late? He goes, no, you're a day late. These are non-refundable tickets. You're- so now I've got to pay like 400, 300 bucks, whatever it is. This is 1985 to take the train and think back. So I'm like, forget this. I didn't say forget this. There was another F word in there. I, I said fire truck. So I jump on the train with no ticket in my bag and just, and just, you know, and stow away. Get, make it through there, get to the ferry, to get stow away on that. Hang out with all these Indian dudes that are smuggling Johnny Walker Red Label in huge suitcases, drinking this, I'm 16, on the thing, finally get to the train in Brussels, and that's it. I'm home safe. Now I'm going to do it. So I'm sitting on the train, and these three American dudes come walking up to the bar, and they're trying to talk to the bartender, uh, but they're not using any French. The bartender is completely blowing them off and speaking to other people in French about what idiots these Americans are. So I said to the guy, I said, hey, listen, you're not going to get any beers or anything that way. If, can, can I order it for you? So I ordered the thing, and the guy tips me 20 bucks. So every time he comes back to the bar, he tips me 20 bucks, tips me 20 bucks. So at the end of this whole thing, um, you know, I probably made a hundred bucks. See, this is 1985, hundred bucks in your oh, kitchen. Yeah. yeah. So uh, these, we get off the train and I'm walking to get on my train to go to my, to where I live. And these guys go, Hey, 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 hey kid, can you help us find a hotel room? And I said, yeah, where do you want? They said, uh, what's the best hotel? I said, I don't know, the Hilton. So I go to the phone, I order the Hilton. They said, see if they have suites. <laughs> All right. I don't know. Now I'm getting a little like, what is going on? They said, yeah, they got a suite. It's you know, 2500 a night. Okay, we want two of them. Can you get us to the hotel, kid? And these guys are pretty. They're from Chicago. They're pretty, you know, they're gritty. They're not weirdos. At least I don't think so. So anyhow, I get them. I take them in a cab, get them there, check them into the hotel, get them upstairs. And the one guy takes off his shirt, and he's got a huge money belt on. I mean, stacks of hundies like this and i'm like what's going on they like, well we we're from chicago we just came over to london to buy some rolls royces and we're going to um we bought the rolls royces so we thought we'd just come down here and, you know party a little bit so forth. so i would skip school every day take the train down to paris and tour these guys around paris mind you i've only been there six months i, I still don't speak very good french and tour them around and they would just pay me and just money. I mean, like, here, go, get us some bar names. Here's some money. <laughs> so the last day we're at the, with the train station, I'm getting him tickets or going to Rome on the train. And the guy says to me, he says, uh, hey, come with us to Rome. His name's Ralphie. Come with us to Rome. I said, I can't do that, man. I got to go to school. I'm, I, live in a, <laughs> I live in a family that's going to lose their, they're gonna lose their shit. And I haven't told my parents about this. This is when landlines were under sea and all that kind of stuff. So he says, no, come on, man. I said, I don't speak Italian. He says, kid, you don't even speak French. You get through everything. You figure out how to make it work. Come on, do this. I said, no, no, no. So he says, okay, well, do me a favor. One last thing before you go. Go exchange this into lira. And he gives me this much money, okay? So you're 16. How big is your hand to carry this much money? I mean, I don't know how much it was, $30,000. And I have to leave the train station, go down to the subway, across the train station, up into the town, you know, in Paris. You know, it's, it's a good 15-minute walk there, 15 minutes back, and 15 minutes, you know. I'm like, what are these guys thinking that I'm not going to take this, you know? But I kind of was starting to get an idea who they hung out with. I think it was some of your Russian buddies they hung out with. <laughs> I bring the money back to them. I give them the money. End of story. 30 years later. Oh, <laughs> I get an email. Is this the same kid from France that's on diners, drive-ins and dives <laughs> and reunited with these guys back in Chicago, maybe five, six years ago. What Holy do you think of that? Shit. Is that a crazy story? Huh? That's insane. Yeah. <laughs> That's, so, anyhow, that's uh, anyhow. We get on to the let's get on to the regular no, no. program. No, 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 no. That's the podcast. The podcast is I just want to hear, dude. 
I'm I'm a fan. So like I you could talk about nothing and I would just sit here and be like huh? <laughs> Dude, your descriptions were so funny. And just the way, you know, it's when you take the comment. Yeah, this is what I love about television done right or comedy done right or just every day done right is when you take the simple things of it and really over exaggerate and exploit it to the point of ridiculousness that everybody just goes exactly because that's how far our minds tweak shit out. You know, take things into these next dimensions like that's really how, you know, like the way you were describing the police officer tonight we party, right? (laughs) Yes. You're like. You know, what is it? I mean, just all the accents were, it was, I could watch it a hundred times, man. Oh, awesome thank stuff. you, man. I want to have you back to Triple G just so you can, have, you can cook with four different personalities in all of your own kitchens. Oh, hey, let me tell you something. I'm, I'm, I'm obsessed. You know, it's so funny, guy. We, you, I, I ran into you when I was working at Travel Channel. We did upfronts in New York. You did a presentation. I think you had just started Triple G and you were saying how they had built the whole studio um, right, like a few miles from your house, and that it's uh, it's really convenient. You were you were, you were on stage. I remember I was sitting next to a guy, Don Wildman. I'd gotten high before. Sorry, Hunter, but uh, I'd gotten high before. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I forgot he was there. <laughs> right. But I got I got high helium high, right. squeaky yeah. voice, right, right, yeah, a workout high, a, a runner's high, and so. <laughs> And I'd had a drink, and this guy, Don Wildman, who was on Travel Channel at the time, said to me, he goes, what are we doing here? But he meant, like, are we supposed to be shaking hands? But I took it, you know, when you hear your high and you hear something differently. And I, I, I thought, what am I doing here? Like, what am I, like, my goal isn't to be sitting in one of these chairs. My goal is to be on stage. Like, I want to be on stage. I want to be performing at a venue like this and have people wanting to hear. I remember seeing you on stage, and I'm high, and I'm going, I want to be where a guy is. Like, guy's got the gig. He's the one talking. People want to hear him. I go, I'm not on my right path. I'm sitting behind some ho- guests or judges from Food Network for something. And Tony Saragusa is behind me. Andrew Zimmerman's next to me. Don Wildman's on the other side. It's all the Scripps family. And I thought, I'm on the wrong path. I ran into you backstage. We did like the ATO secret handshake or something. And, and you... And, and you no, I remember. I'm not, it's, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Listen, I, I got, I'm not that smart. It takes me time to process everything. Yeah. and and. Uh, and you said something, and you, you were like, "Yeah, you you're, you're, you you gave me a compliment." And I thought, "I gotta get off, I gotta get out of this path." And luckily, I got fired from Travel Channel. But like, it means a great deal to know that someone at a moment in my life where I was sitting there going, "Like, I want to be on his path," is saying you watched the Machine Story and that you liked it, and then it made you and your son laugh. That makes me feel like I'm on the right path. If you mean, if you know what I mean. Well, let me to to uh, continue to fuel your fire. Let me just explain it to you this way. You know, we get so busy and I I attribute a tremendous amount of the success that I have to the people that I'm surrounded by. And I make sure that everybody knows that it's not just the guy band. It's it's everybody band. You know, we're all if the band does great, um, then everybody does great. So we all have to add into this. It's not just one person writes a song, one person sets a tempo. So I listen. I, I, I try to spend as much time as I can listening to people around me. You, not just Hunter. You have a you have a bandwidth of fans that are as eclectic and as unique and as diverse as I would say the fans of Triple D are. You have people that get you on the mature level, on the intellectual level, on the immature level, on the crazy level, on the you know, and and so when we started talking about this, and again I send it out to everybody. Hey, we are, what's what's the game plan with this? And everybody, I, there was not one person on my team. From Food Network execs to business partners in Triple D, Triple G, everybody, including Hunter, that said, oh, no, you got to do the show. you got to do the show. This dude is. You two should have been doing shows together for years because he gets it. You get it. So I'll just, I'll just, let me just do your fire, brother. You have got a, a following and an energy and enthusiasm. And, and all I can tell you is you did the right thing. That introspective discussion that you had with yourself, like I, I, if you can't dream it, you can't be it. You know, that's kind of my thing. What yeah, you say yeah. is what you hear, what you hear is what you, what you think, what you believe, what you believe is who you become. So if you can't push those kind of things together, then, uh, but you're doing it, man. Look at it. So you, trust me, you had people campaigning to make this connection happen. Dude, I'm, well, I, I, like I said, I, so my, my rhythm is I get on the treadmill and I watch, I, I mean, to this, my, I, people know 
I get on the treadmill, I open a box of wine, and I will watch diners, drive-ins, and dives. <laughs> uh, I get on the treadmill, I'm eating a hoagie, and I'm on the bike, and I'm just, and I'm letting the treadmill run so I can get the points, but I'm not on it. Okay, that's good. I got to get that for count. It's my favorite. I open a box of wine, start drinking red wine, and just walk like seven miles watching. I mean, you're all that's on the network right now, and it's my favorite. Triple D is my favorite show. Triple G grew on me the way you fall in love with a roommate, like a, like a, a hot chick roommate, and you and you guys are living together, but you're the only ones living there in the summer, and you guys are friends, and you party, and you both smoke cigarettes, and you both like my so-called life, and then all of a sudden one night you're like, oh my god, am I falling in love with her? And then you're like, oh, <laughs> it took the summer to make the hot chick fall in love with you, or you to fall in love with her? Me to fall in love with her, dude. I want to hear more of this story. So yeah, good, especially. Like when you did the chefs against the chefs, like Carl versus uh, like when that <laughs> chef showdown, and, and I was friends with Carl. That yeah, was a a great dude, to right? Watch someone that in their good. element take ingredients and do what they're meant to do with it. I'm sorry, I got to move. The sun. <laughs> we okay. we're sitting. This is this is our backyard, or this is we're at the ranch. So. The sun comes through the trees, and as it moves, it starts creating these weird shadows and gives and giving hatchet face. And all that kind of stuff. So sorry about that. And, when, and my wife is saying, "Go outside, go outside." <laughs> no, um, but it, it's I'll, amazing I'll, to watch the chefs cook. The well, like, you know what? You, uh, I, I didn't know that you were that tight with Carl. Carl was, oh my gosh, so Carl, was, Carl wristband. I, it's, Carl was a good. I have a cooking show called Something's Burning, and I do it online. I do it with comedians. It was I pitched it a food like probably 10 years ago, nine years ago, and they passed. And it was just a stupid idea of me not knowing how to cook, but cooking for comedians and just and just making jokes. And will Carl, you send, will you send that to me? Of course, yeah. Um, so let's let's look. Did you produce it? Yeah, we, I make it. We, we put it online. It gets it gets it's it's online very now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's on YouTube. Oh, it's online now. Yeah, yeah. It's can it, it was be done. Can it be done without uh, uh, without bad, without vulgarities? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's I mean, I, so, I mean, some comedians can't. I mean, that's a weird thing about comedy. Some can't do it without the you know without doing it. It's the ones that can do it with the subtleties that you know. I think. I mean, yeah. not. I don't love all vulgarities. <laughs> you know that, that that's not what I think is funny. But um, to make it PG for uh, for cooking. But uh, now's the time, uh, my friend, to. Uh, re-explore everything as you know the where the industry's at um now's the time to to fire so let's let's look at that yeah yeah and so but carl was the carl was my quote-unquote executive chef when i started it i would call him and i go hey i'm looking for something fun to make for bill burr and tom segura and he was like okay what do you think about and he would walk me through recipes and then i would get the ingredients based off his recipes i didn't even i was unaware of what a talented chef he was. I just, he, I just, he was, he was rather, he was, he was, a, he was a, uh, what is the word that I want to use? A foodophile. He, what he could lock down in his mind about food and what he remembered his dad, his brother, his brother is uh, George is a good friend of mine. Now we became good friends because of Carl's passing. Um, but he, uh, George is a doctor. Uh, a, a very successful doctor and a very smart doctor. And Carl had that same knowledge level of food. I mean, maybe not of the doctor, but I would say they, there's something about the way those kids were raised that they were able to retain information because I could talk to Carl. I would call Carl about stuff all the time. I mean, Carl was my, he was my, my Google search. Hey, Carl, dude, what is the, you know, Oh, it comes for, you know, he just sit there and rattle it off. Like, Carl, I need to get uh, some pricing on uh, white truffles. I need to have like six white truffle prices for me in 15 minutes. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, it's, um, yeah, what a loss. What a loss. It, it really broke my heart. My last text was from, from him was canned chicken. You'll be shocked how good it is. <laughs> that what he said? Yeah. <laughs> said, oh, gosh, he just, uh, we're here at the ranch and this is where we filmed Guy's Ranch Kitchen. And uh, we were here for, we were here for, you know, we we're here for all the big holidays, but um, my youngest writer comes from, and Carl would stay in Ryder's room because um, he'd fit in Ryder's uh, beds. Um, and and uh, that's where he'd stay during Ranch Kitchen because everybody stays at the ranch. All the chefs come in. It's like a big, it's like camp for chefs, yeah. you know, and uh, we hike in the morning and everybody, you know. 
But uh, Ryder comes out, it was New Year's, and Ryder comes out and he brings these pair of clogs out that he found in his closet. <laughs> oh, my gosh, what a teary night that was. Um, but, yeah, what a, what a good dude. Oh, that's funny. I didn't know you knew Carl. Yeah, yeah. I used to, I used to party with Carl. Uh, we used to do radio together. Man, he made me giggle. He's fun. He was funny. Oh, he was so funny, and he was so game. Like I, I'm, I'm obviously a big drinker, and I'd roll in to do radio with him, and we'd pour a cocktail, and immediately he's like, "Come on, buddy, let's go." Oh, he just he. Did you ever hear the? Did you ever hear the skit? I mean, it wasn't a skit. Did you ever hear Penny Chicken? Did you ever hear the Penny Chicken from Opie and Anthony? Or it was just Opie back then? I'm sorry. No, no what was? But that? okay, look up Penny Chicken. Okay. okay. So Penny Chicken, it was me and and uh, and Alex Guarnaschelli. We were in – I was in New York doing some media, and I went by Opie, who's a wonderful guy, and I went by Opie, and Carl, was, and Carl brought us in. And we did, a, we did a bit. It wasn't even a bit. We were just talking about what goes on in the life of food and, and uh, catering and so forth, and we were talking. And it just, it just goes off the rails so fast that we're talking about Carl making deliveries in his car and the chicken spilling out of the car and going under the seat. And I said, what'd you do, Carl? Did you grab the chicken from under the seat, put it back in the, in this thing, you know, and then, but, but it was a penny from underneath the seat that got stuck to the chicken. <laughs> and then he served it at the wedding and somebody bit into it. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, what is this? And Carl says, Oh, you, you know, you, you got penny, that's penny chicken, you know, and it just turned into this, it turned into being such a rant and such a re- ridiculous out of control i mean people were crying people were on the floor people were throwing <laughs> up people left i think people got fired i think we were turned off i mean it was crazy man it was one of the funniest things that ever happened in my life Benny i'm curious to see where his career would have gone because i do think he was just blowing up i was really trying to mentor him and get him on the on the straight and narrow and he knew something we didn't know and he was talking about it. And so I don't, you know, I don't know what to say about it, but he was, you know, incredibly successful on guys grocery games yeah. as a competitor and as a uh, judge. Um, and then we were just getting ready to shoot tournament of champions, which we shot in uh, December. And he was of course in the top 16, you know, I think, I think he was like seated number two. And, um, you know, then he, then he, and, and Gloria called me, I was sitting out there on my patio in my house and, uh, Gloria texted me or called me and I was on a conference call and then she texted me and I didn't even have to look at the text. Yeah. And then, cause it was just Gloria, Carl's brother and myself. And I'm sitting there going, trying to keep it together. I'm, 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 I'm a mess. And I'm trying to figure out how do, who do I call? What do I say? And I'm never at a loss for words. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't even get the words. Oh, it was just the worst. Yeah. But the one thing I will say is that, um, the, it, it's and It's very similar. And I mean, it's just sound the right way. He didn't know how many people loved him and admired him and respected him. And, continue to carry on his name and, 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 and his tribute. And, uh, that's, yeah, it's a tough thing, but it's the same goes with you. You know, you're such a cool, humble, easygoing dude. I don't think you understand the bandwidth of, uh, of an army that you got behind yourself. And, uh, and that's why I said, you know, you got this, got this show idea if it's out there working, let's talk about it. You know, maybe who knows where things go. Did there? I feel like I, I feel like I didn't get successful until I was in my forties. I feel like you have been in on a rocket ship since you were a kid. Do you? Was there ever a time where you just felt like kind of like lost, like you weren't going in the right direction? Well, if you're talking about a rocket ship, if you're talking about the little kid that's in a uh, cardboard box and it's got rocket flames drawn on the side of it, and he's <laughs> got two uh, plastic cups with a piece of string for goggles, if that's a rocket ship, that's the one I've been on. Um, no, you know, I, I don't think that it was ever uh, – I, I, I feel in the same situation you are. The older you get, I think the better you can navigate what you're doing. 
I fortunately was navigating. My dad was super, both my parents are, are awesome and both were super involved in my family. It's still alive. Uh, my dad just beat pancreatic cancer. But both my parents were very, yeah, no just kidding. That's huh? fucking awesome. 76 years old, beats pancreatic cancer, stage three, oh. whatever, and beat it and kick an ass. You know, now I'm trying to get him to stay goddamn home because my parents, why are they acting like children? I'm like, do you not get it? <laughs> but anyhow, uh, my parents gave me that environment. They were hippies, not dope smoking hippies. I have to always clarify that because my mom says, you got to tell people who are dope smoking. Um, but what it was is uh, they were always, anything that I could dream up or think about or talk about or whatever, my dad was like, okay, let's try it. Okay, let's do it. You know, I, I, I called my dad one time. I wanted to go see a football game. I've never seen a pro football game. I was 10. And I said, Dad, the Houston Oilers, because Earl Campbell was my favorite player. I was a Raider fan, but the Earl yeah. Campbell was the man. Mm-hmm. The Houston Oilers are playing the San Francisco 49ers tomorrow, San Francisco. I lived in Humboldt, dude, five hours plus from San Francisco. My dad says, okay, tomorrow morning we get up at uh, five in the morning. We go down there. No tickets. Drives me down to San Francisco. Scalps a couple tickets. This is 1978, you know. So my parents were always super super, uh, supportive and – gave me that idea and I've always lived my life under that that model is that who says you can't yeah no who, who who makes the rules who who says this is not achievable who says you can't go next level who says you can't you know push the bar who says you can't we're, I mean, we're doing this big relief fund right now we're, we've raised 16 million dollars so far for a program called RERF which I it's the Re- National Restaurant Association Educational Foundation and I came together and we've raised 16 million dollars for unemployed restaurant workers in two weeks. I saw that. And everybody's like, well, what makes you think about doing that? I'm like, well, what makes you think about doing that? I mean, that's like, let's go. Let's do it. I want $100 million. You're like, come on, $100 million. You got to quit saying $100 million. I said, no, I'm not going to quit saying $100 million. You can't jump over the thing. You can't jump over the hurdle if you don't establish the hurdle, if you don't say that's what my goal is. Now, I don't make it, then that doesn't mean that I failed. It just means at least I had a roadmap to where I was going. So anyhow, the, the whole thing, it's not been in, by any means, never been handed to me by any means, never been. I built my first restaurant. My wife and I came up pregnant with Hunter, two dogs, a Hyundai with uh, 250,000 miles on it. My pickup truck from college and 5,000 bucks in our pocket. We moved from LA where I was running restaurants and came up to Sonoma County where we, where we live now. And we opened our first restaurant by borrowing uh, $25,000 from my parents who mortgaged their home to get me the money and opened my first restaurant that way. And that is, so that's how the whole thing is. Uh, that's how the whole thing started. So it's not, it's never been a, but it's, you know, you, you, you just work your ass off and you keep good people around you and, and treat people right. And you know, blah, 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 blah. And it, it comes about, but it is no, by no means, do, but that's the, also the thing is what you get because it's now to when you're 40 is when you've worked this hard to get it, you don't squander it and blow it off and treat it, you know, you know, uh, lackadaisically. You got to stick with it, man. You got to work hard. You got to get up on the days you don't want to get up. Yeah, oh, yeah. I want to talk to you about the restaurant. I'm giving you on that talk. fucking rant, by the way. What? <laughs> I, I like it. I like it. You have like ADDs, but oh. yeah, Hunter likes to make fun of the fact squirrel. But <laughs> I think my wife's trying to say, "Are you saying goodbye to me, Laura?" Does your name on the Zoom say the "Machine's Friend"? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Wait, okay, now I got to move because my wife is complaining. She can't get in the kitchen and finish things. But she's leaving. Hunter and I stay at the ranch right now because we're. Um, because we are uh, getting things done. Hang on a second. This podcast is brought to you by Hims. If you have not heard me talking about Hims, then you haven't been listening. Did you know that 66% of men start losing their hair by the age of 35? I was 22 years old. I was in my fraternity uh, living room in the, the lounge. And someone said to me, Jeff Hartley said, bro, you're losing your hair. And it sent a panic through me. And I thought then, what you should know right now is that if you can get in front of it, that's the best way to prevent hair loss. Best way to prevent hair loss is to do something about it while you still have hair loss. For Hims is one stop shopping for hair loss, skin care, sexual wellness, all for men. It is time to write a new chapter in your life. And that chapter starts 
with hair. <laughs> Uh, thanks to science, baldness can be optional. Hims is helping men be the best version of themselves with licensed physician and FDA products approved by the FDA to help you treat hair loss. No snake oil pills, no gas station remedies. Hims was created by a guy who knew that some conversations for men are best to have online. No more in-person awkward doctor visit or long pharmacy lines. For Hims connect you with real doctors online which would save you hours, completely confidential and discreet. Answer a few quick questions, doctor will review, and if they determine it's right for you, they can prescribe you the medication to treat your hair loss shipped directly to your door. Right now, my listeners can get started with their first month for free. Go to 4 slash BurtCast. That's 4 slash BurtCast. Prescription requires an online consultation with a physician who will determine if a Prescription is appropriate. Offer only valid if prescribed. Three-month minimum subscription. Additional restrictions apply. See website for full details and safety information. Remember, that is 4 slash BirdCast. This podcast is brought to you by Blue Apron. I absolutely love Blue Apron. I subscribe by it. It's the reason I have such a great relationship with my daughters is because we eat two home-cooked meals regardless If I'm home or on the road, which lately home is where a lot of life is happening, but we have two meals together where we eat a Blue Apron. It challenges my daughter's palates. They take recipes that we wouldn't we wouldn't normally cook or wouldn't know how to cook. We can introduce to the girls, and they absolutely love with Blue Apron. You can have peace of mind by getting fresh, quality ingredients delivered straight to your door, so you can cook delicious, easy meals in the comfort of your own home. They take the guesswork out of dinner. What's for dinner, guys? Mom will say a blue apron and the girls are happy. You can get ingredients that will be prepared and packaged with the highest attention to quality and safety with a commitment to transparency and reducing waste. Blue apron has your back in many more ways. Any night you get to cook and spend quality time, enjoy a great meal is a night well spent. Over half of their signature menu is stacked with ready to cook meals designed for balanced eating. Create a plan that works for you With Blue Apron's ever-changing mix of premium, plant-forward, vegetarian, carb-conscious, Mediterranean, diabetes-friendly, WW-approved, and 500 calories or less options. Want to try a meal kit, but you're concerned about the packaging? Oh, feel good about your food and your environmental impact with Blue Apron, the first meal kit to partner with How to Recycle, which takes the guesswork out of recycling and is committed to transparency and reducing waste. Over 85% of Blue Apron's packaging is recyclable. And 41% of their packaging is materials that are made by recycled content. How great does that make you feel? They're also the first meal kit company to transition to drain-safe, fully recyclable ice packs. Thank God. Thank God. Those ice packs have scared the living shit out of me since we first started getting them like years and years and years ago. As a kid, you were like, these things are filled with candy. They're not now, guys. These are fully recyclable. Feel good about your choices and create delicious meals at home with Blue Apron. Find comfort in the kitchen with Blue Apron and enjoy delicious home-cooked meals. Visit blueapron.com and check out this week's menu. That's blueapron.com. Blue Apron. Feed your soul. Are you going to stick with me or are you going? I don't know what to How long, how long do you have on this? You know? Oh, I don't know. I'm just shooting the shit I, until he kicks me off. <laughs> I just didn't want to backlight it so bad. No, it's perfect. <sighs> Anyhow, um, I want to talk to you. I want to talk to you about the the fund. I want to talk to you about the ins and outs of restaurants and what they're going through. Because I don't think, I don't think enough. I think people know what's going on, but I don't think what they're they know what. I don't think they know exactly what's going on. You know, like what it's like to be an actual restaurant owner at this time and in, in what's going on. But I also want to talk to you about what one of the things that I, I think just impresses the living shit out of me is your attitude is so upbeat and positive and go do it in an industry that's almost defined by its cynics. Does that make sense? Well, it's, it's allowed to be defined by its cynics if you allow it. I don't allow it. I don't, I think it's, uh, you know, haters hate. I mean, it's, there's, I, I, that's the only thing I like about, I shouldn't say I like, 
It's the only thing I've noticed about our pandemic and our, um, in our situation, our quarantine that we're in, the hate slowed down quite a bit. Man, it has. You know, I am done listening to who hates who and who sucks and who this and that. I mean, it's like you get too many people in the program. Too many people are focusing and, and all they have to do is talk about somebody else. I just, it blows my mind. I've yeah. never understood it. If I have something that I don't like about you and it really bothers me that much, I'm going to come to you. You know, if I don't know you and I don't like you, then I just keep you out of my circle or out of my vision, you know, but to go online or to write mean things, is, I think why do people, God, you are so blessed to be alive. You're so blessed to have, to be breathing today. You're so blessed to get up, you know, and there are things, even when you're a nasty, cynical, bitchy person, you have things you love. You have things you appreciate. Why would why wouldn't you spend time focusing on those things? So I've never, it's just never, and I'm not a big preacher about it. I'm just kind of do things my way. But I tell people, like, whenever I talk to kids that are having trouble with bullying or whatever, I just say, here's the reality. You know what? You're never going to stop it. It's, it's, you just got to change your paradigm of how you uh, allow it to uh, impact you. Um, it's not going to stop. It, it's, it'll always be part of it. I guess it's happened forever through history. But um, can I just ask you a question? Does that say secret time in the back? Yeah, that's my, first, that's my second. That's my one of my Netflix specials. <laughs> probably, probably one of the more awesome things if you're going to hang shit in your office. There's a world map. There's a surfboard. And then there's a belly shot with secret time <laughs> on the... <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome yeah um, but the climate of the industry you know because i bet there's not i bet the cynics have shut up now that everyone kind of needs each other's help well the funny thing is is why is it that you get it, it's it's if you look at things it's that little voice that nobody how do you how, how do you say it it's it's the one percent of the industry you know, yep. you really think about how many great chefs there are, how much is going on, how many people love restaurants, and then 1% of the, meh, 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 this is right, that is wrong, you are wrong, this is bad, you should do this, you should do that. I mean, I don't know. I guess I guess in every, I guess in co comedy you have it. Who goes to a, it's always blown my mind. Who goes to a comedy show and wants to sit there and talk shit to the person performing? Why? Is it because you couldn't make it as a comic and this is your little moment to sit behind your candle table and run your mouth? I mean, I fucking, I've always wondered what goes on. And what do you say? Anybody here speak Russian? No. The one guy has checked on everybody and he can tell everyone that this guy doesn't speak, that nobody here speaks Russian. You know, the one guy wants to pop off. Watch the fucking show. It's, it's, the, it's so true. It's, I think there's people that uh, are so unhappy. They look for hate. They look for hate. They look for the bad stuff that brings them joy is to see other people. I don't know. It's, it's, it's what is so cool about your show. And I don't know if you had this intention when you started triple D was it is blowing up spots that deserve to be blown up. Yeah. No, it, 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 when we started it, I mean, honestly, um, would you just sit down and invo involve yourself in the conversation? I got to go. You don't have anywhere to go. You don't go. have to do anything, Hunter. There's a pandemic. Sit down. <laughs> yeah. So Hunter is in the middle of cleaning the beehives right now, and I don't. You're not moving goats today. Um, so sit down. Enjoy the enjoy the moment. Um, you're not going to get in trouble. I'm the foreman. <laughs> I. Uh, you know when I when I think about it. The, the pandemic and, and you watch how everybody's unifying. I mean, we got a lot of serious, much more serious issues to discuss and to handle. And I was reading an article the other day, and, and I usually don't read stuff like this, but I just want to see how obscene it was uh, of people that were doing good. And then the idiots that were getting called out for calling them out for not doing good enough. Yeah. And it was so funny because it was probably the same cynical people that write about everybody in the hate, but we're really coming down on the mild haters. I mean, I don't even know how to describe this, but it was like, you know, someone donated a thousand dollars. 
well, don't you think that you should have just given $100 to 10 people? Mm -hmm. You know, something like that. But whatever. I didn't think about it. All I think about is all the great people are doing. I mean, look at the look at the energy. And what Triple D was about, finally got back on topic. What Triple D was about, when we first started the show, I thought, man, I'll do this for a couple of years. We're going to run out of spots. There's no way we're going to find all these places. And now after spending this, you know, 13, 14 years doing the show, um, there's, it's never going to end. Hunter will be doing, it. Hunter's got to put on like a hundred pounds and, and get some weight. <laughs> because Hunter going to do the show. And, um, you know, we've got these, these amazing places. And the, and the great thing is, brother, is that the, the trend people are moving away. And this pandemic is really going to make a difference. Just watch this. The trend is moving away from the commercial big operations. It's always been going towards mom. But we've righted the ship, you know, 80s and 90s. How can we get the food fast? How can we get it convenient? How can we get it cheap? Um, consume, consume, consume. Doesn't matter where it comes from. And, and we lost the soul of food or we're, lo we're losing it. And fortunately, through the Food Network, through the Food Gourmet Magazine, James Beard, I mean, through all the, you know, it's through, you know, all these different shows that are food oriented, people say, wait, 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 wait. Food's the heart and soul. Food's the fabric of the, of the family. Food's the fabric of the community. You know, restaurants are in, da, 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 you know, people start going through this whole thing. So fortunately, mid-90s, you know, we start turning this monster around. We get into organics. We get into vegan and vegetarian. And we get into cultural food. And this, and this whole thing goes on. And um, boy, man, to be on the sidelines or in the middle of it, because I was doing my own restaurants, of course, at the time. And to be there capturing this and to putting the camera on these people. I tell everybody, please don't give me more credit than I deserve. I, I'm just the portal. I'm just the light. I'm just show, showing you what's already there. Yeah. It's just that restaurant hadn't been on Main Street of your town where there was chain restaurant, chain restaurant, chain restaurant, chain restaurant, big advertising, big advertising, huge parking lot, great big sign, you know, all kinds of marketing budget. You had to go three blocks over to the dark street where there's one street light, you know, in a funky little place that was in an old gas station. And you walk in there and you get carne asada that blows your head off. Yeah. You know, Indian food. You know, so it's going to continue. And the inspiration that Triple D does for people that have the dream of doing their own joint has just been incredible. So I, I just, I'm blessed with the opportunity and it has definitely grown. I mean, I, most of the team that we have doing the show has been there. I mean, Chico, uh, who's our DP, uh, Anthony Rodriguez, he's been with us. He's been with me, uh, since day one, from day one, from the, from the pilot. Oh. So, um, it's an, it's a pretty amazing group of people that make really amazing. We just did three Hunter was the producer of it. We just did three triple D takeouts. So, it, it, which is going to air next Friday. The oh, first one airs oh, I Friday. love it. But see, it's just like you, though. You're sitting here making things happen when you, most people should just be, you know, day drinking. What was the thing? Watch <laughs> out in 20 years. I read this this morning. Watch out 20 years. The kids who were homeschooled by day drinkers are going to be running the country. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Triple D takeout. We did Triple D takeout. And um, what it is is we went to 12 of our favorite Triple D joints, said, hey, Take your camera, make a new dish that you've been doing at the restaurant or getting ready to do when you reopen, make that dish, video yourself, then send us the dish in whatever incarnation you send it, and then Hunter and I will reproduce it, taste it with you on a video conference, and our, my son Ryder was filming it, um, that means filming it, and uh, <laughs> he's filming it with GoPros, and we blew up three shows in two days they get ready to air. I don't know what they're going to look like. They could be just a hot mess. We just <laughs> a of, here's a bunch of discs. You know, good luck with these. Uh, you know, hopefully, the hopefully sound was on, and uh, those shows will be coming out. But the great thing is, is people are such fans of Triple D, oh, yeah. and let's give them some good entertainment, and let's highlight these restaurants because we're going to need a big push to get people back in restaurants once this, uh, you know, once this terrible situation is over. What's it like when you own a number of restaurants, but don't Maybe you're a bad example because you have multiple different. I'm a bad example and a lot now. <laughs> <laughs> but you have Food Channel. You have your every so many different fingers and so many different pies. What's it like for the average restaurant owner? Like, out of curiosity, like, what kind of cash do they have at like at their disposal? How long can they run without? 
having business? Like, what's it like for the average restaurant owner? Where does the saying you have your finger in so many different pies come from? <laughs> I have no idea. I've heard it though. <laughs> I was going to say women, but I, I think I thought that was inappropriate. <laughs> Yeah, you might that would probably be over like the pies was pretty, you know, subjective. Like a sultan. <laughs> um, so we have uh we have 80 restaurants, about 80 restaurants inside of the knuckle sandwich program from on carnival cruise lines to oh, don't, 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 don't get me started. Don't get me started. The best fucking burger I've ever had in my fucking <laughs> life, without a fucking doubt, is on a carnival cruise ship. There is no better burger in the world than that 4 p.m. I'm drunk. I don't want to take a nap, but I want to keep pushing on until dinner. Burger. Ev my buddy Cowhead right now, he's out of Tampa. Mike Calta, he does a cruise every year that a bunch of us comics go on just for fun. We, we, it's just a fun cruise. Dude, that burger is the greatest burger. And the fact that it's just like, they're like, oh, yeah, load it up over there. Put everything you want on it over there. You want fries? Sure. You want a double burger? Sure. You want extra cheese? Sure. Whatever the fuck you want. It is the greatest fucking burger. And what makes it even better on top of it is it's free. Oh. So when we started that, I'm going to tell you the story about Carnival. When we started it, my agents called me and said, hey, uh, have you ever been on a cruise? I said, nope. You want to go on a cruise? I said, nope. <laughs> I'm not. I'm an outdoors guy. I'm not a get in tight, uh, tight spaces. That's not what I want to do. Yeah. He said, well, they would really like to talk to you about making a burger concept. And I have the burger concept because I'm making this burger in other restaurants that I have. No, I don't want to do it. Eh, six months go by. Hey, they're back. They want to talk about it again. No, no. Carl's with me. I can tell you, I'm in Queens, New York with Carl. Yeah. He's in the car with me and I'm having a discussion with my agent. And Carl taps me on the shoulder and says, you ever been on one of those? A lot of fun. A lot of fun. You know, Carl talks. Oh, fuck, yeah. Oh, you know? Carl's a fucking oh, cruise oh, oh, guy oh, in a heartbeat. Oh, oh. Wait, wait, gotta go. A lot of fun. So I'll go for you. I'll go on there for you. You know. So I said, okay, all right. I'll let's talk to him. So I got back to California. Got my wife, my friends, uh, my mom and dad. Loaded up by like twenty people. We flew down to, to L.A. Went down to Long Beach, and I brought a bunch of food with me to make burgers my, the way I make burgers. You know. Yeah. Got there and uh, did a burger demo for them on the ship. Uh, and started a small fire and uh, all the security gates came down and shut down the kitchen. But that's a whole nother topic. <laughs> um, they weren't quite ready for the, they, honestly, they weren't ready for the level of heat and cook and style. Cause there's no gas on the boats, on the ships. Really? It's only electric. Yeah. You can't have gas on them. So it's all electric so, and no, in open flame. So it's really a different kind of situation. I'm like, anyhow, so we make the food. Da, 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 da. They like the burger. They flip out about the burgers. I made all kinds of burgers. And that night we're having dinner. Uh, the captain and all of the culinary team and my parents, my friends, we're all sitting there. And I said, do you guys understand what I'm talking about for the burger concept and what you guys are talking about? I said, I don't think you guys know what level I'm expecting this. I don't know that you guys can do it. They're like, show us. And it's all Indian chefs. The, the Italians steer the boat. The Germans work on the boat. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the Indian, the, the folks from India are the chefs. No, it's really, it's, it's a very delineated. Oh, I, I, we did, we did a, 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 a thing with travel channel and carnival cruise. And we went down and the Indian chefs okay. had, had, had the most amazing oh, food down there right? that they cooked for themselves that I was like, shut Bro. the fuck up. Bro, <laughs> that's what we do. Hunter and I go on the cruise. We sneak down to the galley like, hey, what are you guys eating? You know, <laughs> we'll just eat what they're eating. Yeah. We've been there. Like, I have to go do it. I don't have to. I get to go do an appearance when we do a new opening. And they're like, uh, chef, so what would you care for in your room uh, before we go? And I'm like, Indian food. And they'll <laughs> bring it. I don't even know what it is. I can't even name all of it. They bring it. Anyhow, long story short, we're having dinner. We're having some drinks. Having some more drinks. And I said, okay, you guys want it? You guys really want to do this? You got that little stand down there by the pool. You know the stand I'm talking about. I said, 8 a.m. Excuse me. What the? I was firing up the jet fighter. Got to <laughs> leave. Got to fly to Flavortown right now. Mom. Peace. Mom. What is she doing? She's firing up the jet fighter. So anyhow, 
7 a.m. We get down there, bring all my buddies. Everybody's hungover. We get down there and uh, they give us these carnival t-shirts. to make everybody turn them outside, inside out, cut the sleeves off all of them, put the sleeves on their heads. It's all the Indian chefs and my buddies. I ride on everybody's t-shirt, guy's burger joint, you know, you know, when you're a little spun still at 7 a.m.? Yeah. Cutting potatoes, soaking them in water, bringing in the meat, getting the buns. And I said, get ready. This is going to get weird. And everybody, you know, I said, give me a dry erase board. So I make up these names. The Plain Jane, that's the boring, you know, the regular burger. And the, the Chilius Maximus. <laughs> I, 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 I guess I saw Gladiator earlier. The pig patty, where we make a patty out of bacon. We grind up the bacon and make the patty out of bacon and a bacon and a burger patty. And I write this whole thing in it. Put it up against the wall with, like, duct tape, you know. 11 a.m., come out with a sheet pan or with a hotel pan. Bam, bam, bam. We're open. And people come through the line, and it is like, I mean, it, people are losing their shit. And the, and the chefs. The Indian chef and the and the and the and the captain and everybody's there and it's it's pandemonium. I mean, it is like you're worried that they're going to take over Tower Records, kind of thing. Oh yeah, I've been in that line when people don't know it's free, and they go bananas. And so we get done, and we sold everything or gave everything away. I mean, we gave away fifteen hundred burgers. My team, my guys are destroyed. They're beat up, tired. The uh, culinary team from Carnival is wiped out they don't even have a clue what's happened and we go and enjoy the the rest of our cruise and we walk we walk up to this whole thing you guys gonna open that burger thing again (laughs) oh you know what do you guys so you know of course we we get the great idea that we're gonna open it up at two in the morning you know we start that but people were there too we didn't open it too but the rumors spread that two in the morning it was gonna open anyhow but back to the state of the industry i'll tell you um, closing the restaurant status thing in the world. And uh, we have a lot of partners in a lot of restaurants uh, uh, around the world. And um, it's, you know, the restaurant, there's not a lot of cash reserves. As owners, there's not a lot of cash reserves. As employees, it's paycheck to paycheck. And a lot of folks that work in the restaurant industry work in the industry because of the flexibility of the hours. So it typically means that their parents, single, single parent families, uh, students, uh, people working multiple jobs in the restaurant business so they can work two jobs, you know, so they work at the, the day shift and the night shift. I mean, there's just a lot of people really dependent on the industry. And I think, and I'm one of them, I don't believe in any way, shape or form that we ever would have thought there's a lot of things that are going to happen in this world, but restaurants don't close. Now, I could never have imagined why restaurants would have had to close. And this is, this is something that is uh, so terrifying. Um, but that's why we did the relief fund. That's why so many groups are stepping up to support the industry. And that's why when we get back, we're going to do a hard court press, uh, a full court press on getting folks back out to restaurants. And, and the restaurants are safe. Don't get me wrong. I mean, <clears throat> there's one thing we do as restaurant owners and as chefs and as, is we know, how to, we know how to keep them clean, do it right, take care of folks, help them out, you know, and um, – and, and of course, nobody wants to squander that opportunity when it comes back around. So it's, uh, it's, we got, we got still got a tough leg to go. I mean, this, this, this fourth quarter, if we're going to call it that third quarter, um, second half. Yeah. It's going to be really tough, but, um, we got to stay strong and we got to stay unified and we got to help people. And the, the greatest thing about our country is one of the greatest things about our country is, is in the time of need, we rally, we rally. Awesome. You know, I hate to see that it takes this devastation, but we rally, you know. Yeah. What, what, now tell me about the fund exactly and how people can help. Cause I saw there was like a $500, like a voucher or something. Well, one of the ways, Bert, is we can auction off all of the stuff in your office right now signed. Uh, and- <laughs> hey, we're, we're moving. My wife would be like, let's do it. <laughs> all right. Um, so what it is, so, uh, this started as a, just a spitball between my attorney who does my restaurant deals, um, Riley, uh, Riley at uh, Davis Wright Tremaine. And he called me one day and he said, so in the middle of this, what are you doing? I said, well, um, I, we have a big rescue trailer. We build a 48 foot long trailer that has a full commercial kitchen in it. I mean, a monster tilt skillet, smokers, fryers, you, you name it. It's this gigantic. And Freightliner gave me a semi truck that I pull this trailer with. 
And so every time we've had fires or disasters, I can show up with this trailer. I don't have a board of directors. I don't have a, I don't have a anything. I just can show up and start cooking day of. Uh, I fund it. I, it's my, you know, my thing. And I have all the chefs and all the cooks. I mean, half the guys that work and the guys are all team members from my restaurants back in the day. So all of them know how to cook, all of them know how to use a chainsaw, all of them know how to hurt a goat, you know, you name it. But um, it's, uh, so, so he called me, so what are you doing? I said, well, there's nowhere to cook, nobody to cook for, everybody's locked in their home. I said, I don't know. And I said, but gosh, I feel bad for the restaurant people. And so we started, started having this big conversation. Then my manager, Reed, got involved. And I said, let's go buy gift certificates. Let's go buy like $50,000 in gift certificates. Okay, that's a great idea. I said, but that's only, that's only this area. What about statewide? Okay, statewide. Call, them, call the president of the, of the California Restaurant Association, Jock Condi. Have a conversation with Jock. Jock says, God, I love it, man. Great idea. Let's raise money. People buy gift certificates. Get money to the employees, the workers that can't get uh, unemployment, because there's a lot of workers that work that can't get unemployment for a lot of reasons that are crazy. Yeah. And uh, we go, okay, great, 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 great. Next morning, I woke up and go, wait a second. I do triple D all over the country. I can't just pick California, even though it's my home state. Yeah. Okay, call the National Restaurant Association. So Jot gets us in touch with National. Said, "Here's the idea. I'm I'm going to write. I'm going to send video messages to the top CEOs in the restaurant industry that sell to them, uh, create products for them, uh, you know, make money from them, whatever. And I'm going to send them these videos to tell them what's going on in the state of the industry." And they said, okay, well, send us the video. I said, no, I'm making a video per each person, individual, individualized. And so I made these videos at home and sent them to people. And three days later, we had, we had $5 million. Wow. <laughs> Holy shit. Wow. And the National Restaurant Association Educational Foundation is used to taking in donations and then taking the money and getting it to the different programs that they support. Yeah. Like, well, this is going somewhere. So we should keep sending out those videos. They're like, okay, well, Pepsi wants to have a talk. Okay, Pepsi, let's talk. Pepsi, boom, opens up the gate, 1.5 million bucks. Uber Eats jumps in. We'll give you 2 million bucks, and we got another 3 million that will do a matching program with customers. Bring it. Yeah. Boom, boom, boom. People runs an article. Boom, 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 boom. People start, it just starts going nuts. <clears throat> so I'm here at the ranch. I'm not. I'm here at the ranch. And I'm getting up at four in the morning to make the news in the East Coast, mm -hmm. standing in my kitchen. <sighs> yes, I'd like to talk to you about RERF, you know. <laughs> and we start gaining attention and we start getting recognition. And you know what it is? I'm going to tell you this, brother. It wasn't, it isn't still, it is about the money because money is going to help immediately. But the emails and the comments and the feeling for the employees of the restaurant industry to know that all these people through all these years that they've been serving, taking care of, making feel great when they come in the restaurant or the bar or the coffee shop or the bagel place or the donut shop, whatever it is, the people now are coming to help them. It's like the jet. You know what someone said to me the other day? It's the gigantic tip jar. I'm like, Oh my God, I got to take it and run with it. It is the gigantic tip jar. It's the guy gigantic tip jar to the industry. So we're at 16 million bucks and counting. We've processed $60,500 grants. So 60,000 people so far are in the pipeline right now to receive their $500 grant. We receive 40 requests a second. Wow. So we're talking three to 5 million restaurant employees without jobs. Huge. And Absolutely. there's so many industries that deserve all the attention as well of getting money funneled to them and supporting those workers. I just happen, you know, I'm a chef, I'm a restaurant dude. This is all I've ever done my, in my whole life. Yeah. And what I'm doing right now is focusing on, you know, my industry, you know, but I think everybody should, you know, so I'm not saying it's the only one and the only one that should get the attention, but in my situation, that's, that's what we're doing. So, no, but we, it's been, uh, yeah. so R E R F dot U S restaurant employee relief fund dot U S is where people can go uh, to make a donation, which is a great place, and to also uh, apply for the $500 grant. And the emails that we get from people about the $500 grant, bro, I don't care how questionable you are about society and mankind and well-being and, and feelings and love and positive energy, all you got to do is read one of them. 
and you'll be like, okay, what else can I do? How else can I, you know, so I, I wish it was one of those things like you, you take the, what was the, the Grinch, you know, and how they changed the Grinch. You know, you yeah. take people that have negative energy, just let them read a few of these, you know, about my kids have no diapers and no food and nobody in my apartment building has anything either. And I just got a $500 check. You know, that kind of stuff goes on. So, um, yeah. And the other thing is, and here's the last piece on it. <clears throat> Someone said to me, well, what if I can only give $10? And I said, do you know what $10 is to somebody that doesn't have $10? That's dinner for four tonight. That's a feeling of safety. That's a, it's a feeling of knowing where your meal's coming from. You know, it's like no kid hungry. What an awesome, I mean, that's where I really love that there's so much attention being put, which I do a lot of work for no kid hungry. But it's that thing that we say throughout the year about no kid hungry. I mean, how difficult. Kids are supposed to worry about getting their ball from over the fence. Kids are supposed to be worried about, you know, <clears throat> fighting with their sister. You know, kids are not supposed to be worried about where they're getting something to eat, going to bed hungry, you know, malnutrition. I mean, come on. We have the powers of the greatest country in the world. These are the things that we need to be, you know, rallying together and supporting. So, anyway, yeah. R E R F. That's the that's what I'm saying. I feel, I feel like I feel like so I'm, much, brother. I'm telling no, you. No, 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 dude. I, I've been, I've been seeing you talk that's about close. it. It's been running during uh, Triple D and Triple G. So, I've been seeing that nonstop and I just got an alert and we're doing the same thing with comics as comics we're doing we did a big uh comedy gives back thing where uh we're trying to raise money for comics that are going to that are going broke we're doing something me rogan uh segura and joey diaz are doing something for the store employees next week awesome. so you do I, you do it in your own lane and you try to stay in your lane and go I, look i'm not I, I should never talk to you about politics or anything i should just try to make you laugh but if i can focus a little bit of my energy to do something good look i'm not a big guy I, but to for the people that i'm going to interact with for the rest of my life i want to help them out you know what it is also is that the unification and the support you know how many people it makes feel it, it, people that wouldn't get money i mean i know some people that sent me emails that are past team members of mine from other restaurants that said i don't need it but it's just great to know that people are out there doing it you know, that's a big thing also. There's something about just feeling secure and, 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 and having having actions that are going on around us that are making us feel better, you know. And, and I said this to a lot of folks. It's not sometimes the check. It's just the hug, you know, just a big warm hug. Yeah. It's, um, it's, it's knowing that someone is th – that you're not invisible, you know. Yeah, that and you matter. That, that you matter. And, and I think that's the – I don't know. I think this is going to change my kids. This will change my kids forever. We went to order pizza the other day and they said, they said, what well, we should order from find a local place that, that we haven't ordered from in a while to make sure we can keep them afloat. And you're like, you're fucking How old are these kids? 13 and 15. They're idiots too. They're not, not the brightest kids. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is, it is exactly that. And that's exactly, that is the mindset. That is the change that's going to happen. <clears throat> All the things that have been going on and are still going to be going on in this world, it's when our paradigm changes. Yeah. You know, when the paradigm changes, that's when we're going to see the, the positive side. I mean, look how lucky we are, how fortunate we are to live in the United States. We bicker and fight and point fingers and cause problems and everything. We live in the greatest country in the world yeah. with the most resources and the best. And we've got the best plot of land. You know, we got we got a, a pretty good foundation about how to do things, you know. And we have this infighting that goes on that really distracts us from the, uh, the successes uh, that we could all be sharing. And it just blows my mind. But I think this is going to – I think you're right. I think this is going to – uh, this is going to change a lot and change and, and for in a, in a good way. Um, yeah. and I hope I'm curious we, how it's I'm I hope curious we get how it's going to in, change Hunter's generation. I'm sorry. I'm curious how it's going to change Hunter's generation because right now is the time he'd be. It's like it's like being young and out of college. Like I, I like it. that's the most interesting time in your life, and to be like put on pause for indefinitely is like got to be like frustrating as shit. Yeah, you know, and I'll let Hunter speak on that. Um, I don't think we know. It's kind of like when something drops in a pond, 
what the ripple effect will really yeah. be. You know, what is the design that will come out of it? Um, but a, a friend of mine is a counselor at a high school and he said, you know, the kids were having some tough times and um, getting a little, and this was weeks ago. And he said, could you, could you send a message, an inspiring message? And I said, yeah, I'll send it over to you. And I said, <clears throat> Well, everybody, I said, congratulations. You get to be part of history. You know, everybody wants like, when's our part of history? You know, when, when do we, besides the iPhone came out, you know, yeah. well, you're in it, you're in a big one. <laughs> and this is going to define a lot of the decisions that you'll choose to make when you become the leaders of the community and the leaders of the world. So please pay attention. Please don't tune out to this, this pandemic, you know, make sure that you're present as you can be. Um, that's on that side of it. On the other side of it, let's slow down our lives a little bit and get back to some of the fundamental basics that make us really strong. And let's communicate between you know people, not through phones. Let's uh, do some old-fashioned handwritten letters to Grandma because she could probably you know use a little of that love. Let's uh, learn some of the things that we're not really good at: cooking, yeah, um, yard work. You know, let's take this and kind of expand our let's expand our resources and our profile. And, and it was great. And 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 I and I sent it to my buddy Norm and, and I said, How was that? And he says, spot and a couple of parents from the community that, that that it went to sent me messages like the message was awesome, you know, it was and, and, and realistic also. I mean sad I and mean, cautious, yeah. but um it is the truth. So I don't know. I think hunters, I think the ones that are tuned into it, and I think Hunter's pretty tuned into it, the ones that are tuned into it are going to start having this play uh, through the rest of their lives. But I do agree with you. I think it's our 13 and 14-year-olds that are going to really have this impact them in the next seven years. And then that's when it's really going to get its, uh, its uh, growth and its you know, trajectory. What do you think you're going to do, Hunter, for, when you, when, for a living? Um, clean the beehives and manage the goats. Yeah. By the way, don't even get me started. I'm obsessed with fucking beehives. Do you have bees? No, we, I just did a series for Netflix. And one of the things I got, a, I got a cabin in the woods and I had comedians come up. And one of the things is we had beehives we could tend to. And I was obsessed. It was one of the, me, Anthony Anderson. It was, it was awesome. I got the best Anthony Anderson story in the world. Oh my God. (laughs) <laughs> we're, we're we're up in uh we're at the championship golf tournament in tahoe okay um the the uh it, it's hysterical it's a, it's it's the century century golf tournament and it's the uh, the the uh, celebrity pro-am uh and they're up there and we have our pizza trailer we have this big uh, mugnani italian wood-fired oven on the back of the trailer and they invite us up and like come up and play golf and i'm like i suck at golf but i'll come up and cook something so we went up there. We parked it right on the on the on the on the uh, practice range, and uh, they call it practice range, driving range, driving range. Yeah, driving, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. How much I know about practice range, gun range, and uh, <laughs> and we're making pizzas. Charles Barkley comes over. Everybody, every celebrity came over and got a pizza, and we're sitting there talking. And Dan Quayle's there. So Dan Quayle says, "God, I'd love to learn how to make a pizza." So I said, "All right, Dan, j- jump on." And so Dan's over there, and he's kind of making pizza. Well, then comes Anthony Anderson. And Anthony's a little tuned up. And he gets on and he goes, God damn, Dan Quill. <laughs> Dan Quill's trying to make the pizza. And Anthony Anderson is in his face this hard for 20 minutes. Oh, my God. Oh. I couldn't breathe. I had to get off the truck. I had to get off the, off the trailer. We're over in the – I'm laying on the grass. And, he, and, and Dan Quill's trying to make the pizza. And, and, and Anthony, they were having a great time. They were going back and forth. Dan throws the pie at him, throws the skin at him. You do it then. You know, they go, but yeah. Dan Quill, just, you know, Anthony can get so quick. And so, oh, oh. He, is, he delivers, man. Every time you're with him, he delivers. He is the, exactly how funny as you want him to be. It just what I, I, I've never known. I've never seen the ceiling of when he stops or how it goes. But everything the dude says kills me. But anyhow, oh, back to the bees. No, he was he was obsessed with bees too. Like we both, <laughs> me and him, were like, this is something we could do. Like I would love it. My daughter's terrified of bees, but and so I'm. Don't even get me started on bees. Well, bees are so misunderstood. Yeah, and bees, especially honeybees, have no interest in messing with you. Uh, yellow jackets are horrible and need to be taken out. I hate those things. Wasp, the same thing. But the honeybees, 
Uh, so many people don't understand how vital, I mean, they, a bee's life, go watch that movie. That'll kind of uh, wake you up um, to what they really do. But they are the fundamental, I mean, they're, you're talking about someone weaving the fabric of the world. Um, yeah. But everybody. Honeybees are like, honeybees are like Muslims. They are very misunderstood. Yeah, of course, one's going to sting you every now and then. But for the most part. Didn't see that coming. <laughs> I've never heard that reference. I've never heard that reference in my I life. I to watch your face freeze and to watch Hunter look at you and go. <laughs> very interesting. This is really taking quite a spin. <laughs> They're very nice. <laughs> we need them. We need them. Oh, um, God, that was great. Are you out? You leaving already? Man, we got to say goodbye real quick. This podcast is brought to you by MeUndies. Hey, friends. So you may have heard of MeUndies before. They're pretty much on every podcast ever. But besides that, MeUndies makes the most comfortable, soft, sustainable underwear you've ever had in your entire life. They literally designed their undies for comfort and self-expression. So whether you opt for a solid pair of black underwear or a unicorn print, you'll do it as comfortable and as cuddly as a kitten. Get that? I very seldom wear underwear. I wear I'm wearing underwear today. As a matter of fact, I'm wearing MeUndies today. I'm not going to show you my underwear. That would be aggressive. Um, because I've been running a lot. And when I run, I simply run in MeUndies. I don't soil a pair of running pants. I throw on MeUndies. They got great comfort, great support, no chafing. They go all the way down my legs. And it really is what I run in. I kind of be honest with you. I would sell these just as running pants. Like they're that comfortable. Of course, if I take them and I'm going to run outside, I put a pair of gym shorts over them. But if I'm in my man cave, I just throw on me, me, my me undies. I'll tell you right now, it's time to end your toxic relationship with your tattered old undies. You ever put on a pair of old underwear and your junk just flops around in it? Oh, not in me undies. Me undies offers endless options for those looking to up their undies game. You can choose a monthly membership, build a pack. You can even match your undies with your other half. Ooh, -hoo. I like that. No matter what you choose, you'll get a soft, sustainable pair of undies delivered straight to your door with free shipping, win-win all around. Me Undies is made with soft, sustainable fabric and available in all sizes, small to 4X. From black to unicorn, Me Undies prints are made for your self-expression. Me Undies has great offers for my listeners. Right now, any first-time purchaser, you'll get 15% off plus free shipping. That's a no-brainer, especially because they have a 100% satisfaction guaranteed with them. That's 15% off your first order plus free shipping with 100% satisfaction guaranteed. Go to MeUndies.com slash Bert. That is MeUndies.com slash Bert. So what are you going to do, Hunter? Um, love you, Mom. I uh, went to my cabin, my bathroom, and let the pack in the end. Oh, mm -hmm. This must be more time than you should have. Okay. Thank you. Guys, safe. Love you too. Love your socks. Um, so I'm out oh of college. Gosh, what week? And then obviously this happens. How much, so how much time you got left in college? Uh, love you too, buddy. What's that? Okay. How much time you got left in college? I just graduated in December. From UNLV? Yeah. How was that? It was good. It was actually a really good, really good school. A good program for hospitality. Oh, uh, is that what you did? Mm -hmm. Hospitality? Yeah, and it wasn't like a huge school like you found on the East Coast. Um, it was more of just kind of like a community school. So, everyone, you know, everyone kind of got together, but it's more on the strip. Uh, but it was great for great for hospitality and restaurants and business. We had a bunch of big time executives uh, that come to our school and give us talks and hand out you know, internships and jobs. And it was a really, really good program. So, it was fun. But uh, my plan is now, you know, this is all put on hold. So I'm basically learning as much as I can about ranching and, you know, doing more culinary with my dad and learning as much as I can before this gets, you know, back on track. That way when it's go time, it's go time and I can be ready to hop into Knuckle Sandwich, you know, his business and uh, bring what I can to the table. So I'm just yeah, trying to... Television? Yeah, television too. We've been doing a lot of shows together for Triple G, Triple D... Um, I was working as a producer on his Triple G show. So trying to get some more TV time as well and, and get better at it. And uh, hopefully one day, you know, play a bigger role in it. So it's been going good. That's awesome, man. That's, yeah. That's really great. My my dad was, in, you know, he's still a major part of our family. And, I, you know, I run all my stuff through him. And, you know, you, you never lose that. But he always made the, the environment very fertile for me. And that's what I tried to do with Hunter. 
Um, the rule is you're not going to sit on your ass. So you're starting work at eight. Pick what job you want to do. You know, what do you want to work on today? But you're doing something. You know, and that's how Hunter's uh, piece has been. Uh, so a few weeks, he was down in L.A. before the pandemic uh, doing post-production <clears throat> for, um, for a variety of shows, um, you know, that we do. And then uh, he's up here right now uh, learning the bee business, learning the, you know, learning the pond business, learning the goat business, you know, the, all these different things that we have going on. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, I never wanted to be one of those dads, and, and my dad wasn't of uh, saying, this is what you have to do, you know, whatever you're going to do, apply yourself to it and be, uh, you know, and, and I'll give you all the tools that I can give you and all the support I can give you. And, you know, here we go. My parents weren't in the restaurant business. They never saw that. That was not their, their jam. Uh, they were yeah. the retail, uh, they were in the saddle business, making boots and or making uh, saddles and Western, you know, Western tack and sold cowboy yeah. hats and all that kind of stuff. So. Wow. I didn't know that. The, yeah. uh, the it's it's interesting to me because I was immediately when I found out you had a wine you, you that you have your own wine uh hunt and ride as I immediately thought to myself oh my god if I was guy's kid I'd be like dad I think I found out what I want to do I'm, <laughs> I'm going to the vineyard I'm gonna write poetry at night and <laughs> it's the wine industry and again it's one of those doors that I wanted to open I wanted to open it for myself because we love wine um we don't drink boxed wine on seven mile treadmill hikes, but we're <laughs> going to start tonight, you know, cause that's why wouldn't you do that? <laughs> Ricky Gervais said in that great line, I don't go to, what does he say? I don't go to the gym cause I want to, I just do it so I can drink more wine. Uh, maybe <laughs> yeah. that wasn't, no one said it like that, but anyhow, um, I knew that the door is hard to open. There's a lot you have to figure out a lot you got to do. And the wine business is really tough. But I wanted to do something. And of course, everything in my world is about my sons, Hunter and Ryder. So hunt, ride, Hunter, Ryder. <clears throat> and at the time, we owned a little uh, five-acre patch of some really phenomenal Pinot. We since have sold that. But we learned the game about, we brought in a great winemaker, a guy named Guy, Guy Davis, and started making wine and had some good success with it. Not overwhelming success, not, not uh, buying a yacht success, but doing it. And it it'll, it gets as it gets as good as you want to put time to it. We have mm-hmm. a lot of projects, and so it's just it's something that's kind of in its mode, slowly doing what it does, slowly gaining attention, slowly growing. Phenomenal product. That was the one deal that you know, we probably could have made lesser product and grown faster, but we didn't want to do that. We want to make really good wine. But we're doing that. We also are in the tequila business. Sammy Hagar and I mm-hmm. uh, started Stanto. Hold on, I saw I saw you and Sammy do an episode of I think it was Triple D, right, right. And, oh, oh yeah, Sammy and I've been buddies for a long time. I, I'm just a fan of Sammy. I mean, I love Sammy, and and I just bothered him enough till he finally let me be his friend. Um, <laughs> so yeah. that's kind of what happened. That, no, really, he was selling uh, Cabo Wabo. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I was the number one Cabo Wabo account in Northern California selling Cabo Wabo in my restaurants. And the thing was, whoever sold the most Cabo Wabo got to go to Sammy's concert and party backstage with them. <laughs> well, we'll start selling it to clean pots and pans if we have to, you know, <laughs> whatever, whatever it takes. And so after years of being in Northern California and knowing it, and then when my, you know, situation changed with the Food Network and so forth, and he gave me some really sage advice back in the day. And uh, we just became buddies. And matter of fact, I told him uh, when he sold Cabo Wabo, I said, if you ever do tequila again, I want in. And I got the call about two years ago and he said, you ready? So here we are doing Santo. So we've got a mezquila, which is half uh, mezcal and half uh, uh, Blanco tequila. And then we have a Blanco, a silver tequila. Um, both are being highly recognized. And then we have an Añejo and a Reposado coming out here in the, well, it was supposed to be the second quarter, but it'll probably be the third quarter now. But uh, yeah, all, all real artisan, great. Uh, Sammy kept all of his contacts out of uh, Mexico from when he was doing it and 10 years later here we are back in the tequila business i have a great sammy hagar story i was a judge i had a tv show when i first got into this business i had a late night tv show and me and the other co-hosts were judges for miss cabo wabo and sammy showed up and it was a big swimsuit contest and whoever won miss cabo wabo not only was going to be the representative of cabo wabo but she was going to go out on tour with them so we're sitting behind this panel we're getting ready to see all the girls come by and sammy comes up with three bottles for the three judges 
of Cabo Wabo. One of the judges is Kevin James's brother, Gary Valentine. And he gives us the bottles and he signs each of them and he leans onto our judges table and he goes, number three. And we went, what? And he goes, the winner is number three. Thank you, gentlemen. And I go, hold on, we haven't seen him yet. And he, he leans in and he goes, she's going to be the head of my brand and I'm going to be on tour with her. I don't want one and I don't want two. The winner, gentlemen, thank you, is number three. <laughs> Sammy is a bit, I mean, you want to talk about an awesome musician and a creative dude. Oh, dude. Oh, he is a driven business dude. That guy, he'll forget more than most people ever learn. Yeah, the dog. Yeah, I, I looked at you, I looked at you when I was on travel and I thought, I, I watched you develop and you went, and, and it was, a, it was a natural progression of like, of like, the bigger you got, the more you branched out, the more restaurants, the more you kind of said, I want to do this. My one thing that I thought was brilliant, this was my one business plan, was as Travel Channel, I wanted to open Airbnbs as a host of Travel Channel so that you could go vacation in my house. That was my brainchild. Get like really? a, get a, yeah, well, it w- I'm glad I didn't do it. I would have fucking just taken a bath. That's in a lot show. of money. And to yeah. be, I mean, you just do the, you just do the business plan on that. And you're like, uh, how many days can I, how will it pay? Yeah, that's, that might get a little tough. Yeah, what's uh, what's next for your business plan? I mean, I feel like you've got so many so many fires going. What's next? What's like the big? What's the big white whale for you? Uh, the tequila is a big hit for us right now. That's a that's a big. My dog Smokey. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Guy with the uh, big trucks and, and hot rods and a chihuahua. Um. <laughs> I think producing TV. I don't want to be on TV forever. Um, I mean, I enjoy it. Don't get me wrong, but I really get a big charge out of producing. I love, you know, what this is, I love seeing other people get their time, their shot their, you know, So I love, I, I really enjoy that. I, I love opening. I love restaurants and, and always being in the restaurant business and that, that collaboration because they get the, the creative factor of TV and the creative factor of, of restaurants are probably what intrigued me the most or what excite me the most. Um, I, I really enjoy the philanthropy side of the world and, and enjoy helping other people, uh, watching my kids, you know, doing what they're doing, watching Hunter morph into and develop into, um, being a, a contributing partner in, uh, in knuckle sandwich. Um, so I can't say that, uh, I can't say, I mean, I, we're doing it. I'm doing yeah. everything. You know, I, I want to, I'm really trying and I've been working with people on this and, and talking and going through multiple levels and, and spent a lot of money trying to figure out, but I'm trying to figure out how to get 25, eight, but I haven't found 25 hours a day, eight days a week. Oh, I'm yeah. trying to get the whole calendar chain. <laughs> that, 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 that was, that was awesome. <laughs> Suck it on <laughs> Uh, I want to get it. Listen, I need more time. You know, I can't, I can't sleep any less and go any harder. Um, that's what we laugh about inside of the family is how I, you know, my drive, but I'm, I'm at the, I'm having the best time in my life. I mean, I'm, I had a dream last night that I figured out a way to borrow night hours, meaning darkness from the <laughs> fall and then supplement them now. So that's funny, huh? That's funny. <laughs> that's borrow night hours, 25, eight. My setup was awesome. Um, I hate, I gotta be honest with you, night to I me is that. so overrated. <laughs> I wish we could move daylight savings. Time. I would rather have the day start at complete dark and, and then have it get daylight at nine. So it could stay uh, light until 10. Okay. You know, I've, I've never wanted to go to Alaska more than when it has the summer. I'm going up there this summer, actually in September, um, is going up there to, uh, I want to see this. I love daylight. I love being outdoors. I, you know, all that kind of stuff. So to me, like, let's just get this sleep thing over with. Sleep, sleep, sleep. Okay, I'm back. Yeah. Now. I've been planning trips. I've been, I literally was like, when's the best time to see the Aurora <laughs> Borealis? Like, I've been planning trips like fucking crazy. We're supposed to start touring again in uh, September, August, September. And I am, I told my girls, I'm going to get on the tour bus and I'm not getting off until 2021. Like, I'm done. Well, Hunter and I were supposed to be in, um, China. We were going to all through Asia. So when Hunter graduated high school, I took him to Europe. We did seven countries, 14 cities. I, uh, I saw that on TV. Episodes. I'm sorry? 
Did I see some of that on TV? <laughs> yeah. Probably. Yeah. 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 So we did that. So I said, when you graduate college, where do you want to go? He said, let's go to Asia. So we were Korea, Vietnam, China. We were going through the whole thing, 30 days. So, of course, a couple months ago, one of my producers from another show, my, my mentor, this guy, Mark Disson, called and said, hey, listen, heads up. This uh, virus is going to get bad. I'm like, come on. And he said, no, cancel. And so we started looking into it. So we canceled long before that. But, uh, yeah, we were all bummed. We we're really bummed because that was our big trip. But when this all mellows out, we'll, you know, we'll make it happen. But now they continue to scare you off. So maybe when Hunter gets married, we'll go do the trip. <laughs> Well, when this all when this all mellows out, I have to have you guys to one of my shows. I would love that. Oh, bro! Yes. Listen, just if you can please replay the machine, I just I want you know I'll cook the meal. Okay, man, we get together and I'll cook you a meal, whatever meal you want. The ranch. And I just yeah, actually, why don't you come to the ranch? You should come up and hang out with us at the ranch, I'll and I'll cook the meal, and you just give the machine because, <laughs> dude, it was. Um, it's, but you know what? What a talent to make. Uh, you know what? What you did last night is when we were watching a variety of clips. Is you suspended time, and we didn't think about, you know, Groundhog Day of being here and going through the same routine that we've done for the last. You know, it's just a really neat gift to have where you can take people out of their lives for a little bit. And you know, I do a lot of work with the Make Wish Foundation, and. When all the when the families come to Triple G or Triple D, I always try to do that. Let's let's just leave behind what was going on and let's completely suspend you into something completely different. The whole family, the kids, siblings, I mean, and and do that because that little respite, that little break, oh. uh, is just such a wonderful thing for people to kind of recalibrate and reset the clock. Oh, you're uh, my you're my recalibrate. Every time I get on the treadmill, I'm telling you, I it's to the point <laughs> last night. Last night, I, last night we were sitting before dinner. We were looking to uh, watch a movie, and I, I my my go to is either cooking or food. Those are my or DIY. I'm not an H H G T V guy as much, but cooking or food. And you were on, and I put it on. And Georgia said, "My oldest goes, uh, oh, can we can we please not watch guys' grocery games again? Dad, it's the same episode." I said, "No, they're not the same episodes. We haven't seen the same episode twice." <laughs> Leanne says, my wife goes, uh, dad actually has him on the podcast <laughs> tomorrow. And my youngest, Isla, just walks through and goes, oh, that's going to be a bro fest. And just walks How old is she? He's 13. Brutal. This kid is brutal. Amen. Hey, oh. uh, which, is the, which daughter is the one that struggled with the Proverbs? Isla. That's the youngest. Same kid that puts her deodorant in the refrigerator. If you watch Secret Time, that, that Secret Time is an homage to that child. She is oh, the weirdest yeah. fucking kid. She said to me the other day, she goes, We're t I don't know what her she, analogy she was trying to say, but she says, I'm trying to do something. And she goes, well, I wouldn't worry about that, Dad. You can't get someone pregnant twice. And I go, no, you, you totally can. I was like, that's how we have you and your sister. And she goes, oh, well, I mean, you can't get someone unpregnant. I go, no, you can do that too. I go, I'm not sure what analogy you're trying to use but you're misusing them she's like whatever but how awesome swinging the bat at that age of oh. laying it out there this kid is so bizarre it that's is awesome yeah well um you know what bro we got a lot to do and a lot to uh a lot of focus and future and opportunities and we gotta we gotta align that we gotta circle the we gotta circle the wagons and align the. No, we gotta align the wagons and circle the stars. You know what I meant. Are you sure? Yeah. No, I was just trying to be funny. Okay. <laughs> um, but we gotta circle the wagons, bro. We got we got more to do. And uh, why don't we do this? Why don't we figure on getting you in on a uh, on a triple D? I don't know what your favorite city is or where you like to go or if you have some of your own spots. But let's uh, let's think about something that could be. Um, influencing, you know, here, I'll, I'll spitball this. We could do one where we get you uh, and a couple of your fav uh, favorite comedians down yeah. in LA that have uh, their favorite dives, their favorite triple D type joints, and we can kind of pick them out and then doing something to focus on comedians and food, kind of like we did on Triple G. So, yeah. There's something there. We can, we can I, and, that and there'll be an egg on top of everything. Over oh, delicious. Do you see me on, on Fallon? 
No, I didn't. Wait, what happened? It just it was last month, but uh, we went there and Jimmy was you know was having a little chit chat before the show about you know what you won't eat, and what you don't like, and he goes, "What's this thing with eggs?" I'm like, ah, I don't like eggs. I said, "I've had I grew up on a ranch and you know grew up in a small town. You grew up with chickens, you know." Yeah. It's all enough. All right. It's chickens in our backyard. Yeah. Oh, we have chickens. We have chickens yeah. in, uh, everywhere. But yeah. uh, which are, they're super important. And, and, and again, talk about a, a sustainable workforce. I mean, they do everything. But a, a chicken and over easy egg is about the worst thing in the world for me. Mm -hmm. So oh, another, another story there. about Isla. Isla, one day we're having egg sandwiches and Isla goes, so is this the, the chicken's poop? And my wife goes, no, it's their period. And she grabs her sandwich. She goes, I guess I'm done eating egg sandwiches. <laughs> Hasn't had an egg since. So that's where mine came was egg sandwiches. Yeah. We were making fried egg sandwiches and a fertilized one hit, hit the pan. <laughs> oh, my God. So that just brings it all together when you're 10. Yeah, that makes sense. I was kind of, you know, I was kind of, and then the hard boiled eggs. They, they all, uh, yeah. yeah. So any other <laughs> chocolate. <laughs> So uh, when this, when this all wraps up, man, when this all wraps up, we'll do it. I'd love to do a triple D. I'll get me. I know Segura, me and Segura are a game in a second. And then anyone, literally anyone, you guys, uh, any comic you like, I'll hit up and we'll, we'll do that. And then, and I got to come to the ranch, man. I got to, I got to have a, I got to have a tequila with you guys. <laughs> yes. Dude, by the case. No. Oh, so I'd say, so Fallon brings out eggs and he gives them to me. And he says, you know, to have an egg shot. So I shot a raw egg on the show. <laughs> and everybody and their mother, all my friends were like, oh, my God. Can't believe you did it. I said, I'm fine with that. Just don't cook it and give it to me. <laughs> well, thank bro. you for doing this, guys. It means what a lot. What a blast, thank man. What a fun show. And uh, do you do this by video and audio? Or I do this. I normally do these in person in my man cave. And I travel and do this. So when I come up to hang out with you guys, we'll do a podcast up there. And it's just, it's, you know, for me, it is when I left travel, this is where my voice was. It's an extension of social media. I tell everyone they should do a podcast, but you know, my, my buddy, Joe Rogan has a very successful podcast and he was a big part of me starting mine. Well, you please do me a favor. You know, I've, I've met Joe a few times and I'm one of the investors in UFC and we're big UFC fans. And, you know, I told Joe yeah. the first time I met him, I said, Joe. If you ever walk away from this job, this is the job I want because I love MMA. I mean, I've I've been I've been uh, UFC since back in the early '90s, down when it was the Gracies, and I was running restaurants in Redondo Beach, and their you know their center was down there. Any blah blah blah. But I haven't been able to uh, connect with Joe, and um, I really would like to because we have so many from bow hunting to you name it. We have so yeah. many, and, and for some reason, I can't get. We can't get the uh, the uh, connection to happen. So you well, he's still hey, he's still doing live podcasts and he's doing uh, COVID tests in his studio. He yeah. Oh, he's amazing! He, he's, he's amazing, and and we all have him to thank. I mean, I don't do any podcasts, but it's something I'm get requested about every day. Oh, please! Um, but thank goodness for Joe and for uh, his tenacity in what he started, because now, of course, it's a multi million dollar program. Um, in so many facets with so many fingers, but he's opened the door for so many other folks and really made it something that is, uh, that, you know, that people can work from. So, uh, please pass it along. And I, I, I need will. some connection there. I will. I will. We're just texting this morning. It's Segura's birthday today. So we've all been texting together. So I'll let him know. And, uh, and I, I can't thank you guys enough for doing this. This is what a blast, bro. What yeah. a blast. And, you know, just remind, just remember what my title says. The machine's friend. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we end this. That's perfect. Thank you, guys. Stay safe. I can't thank you enough. Good hang. We'll do it again soon, bro. I'll see you see, guys. I have the kids, by the way, and I want to meet them. By the way. <laughs> I want to meet you. Oh. Can't get pregnant twice. <laughs> and you can't, you can't unpregnant. No, you can. I don't know where you're going. That's the. That to me is my takeaway. Done deal. Done deal. Be good, brother. Take care. All right, guys, thank care. you.